Welcome to the Metal Voice. Uh, returning guest, Bobby Blitz, all the way in the East Coast. I'm Wait, assuming. East Coast, Seinfeld territory, but I'm actually <laughs> in Jersey. I'm in Jersey. In Jersey, all right. New record. Bobby, I heard it for the first time yesterday, like quickly. I didn't get much time to absorb it, but I was completely impressed. I mean, Scorched, coming out April 14th, I think. A nuclear blast. Wow. I think, you know, I guess COVID has been good to you, like in that sense, right? <laughs> I don't know. Let's say it hasn't been good to us. We took it. We took advantage of the opportunity of uh, gotcha. uh, luxury of time. I think that that would probably be the best way to put it. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. It's directly responsible, I think, for the results, especially my results on it. Um, I think the other guys, you know, they they tweaked and pushed and pulled and pinched and uh, you know added things over that <clears throat> over that three year period. But for me, I I mean, I tore that record down a few times just to make sure that it was uh, that it was a metal record, you know, worthy of the luxury of time, you know, as as opposed to a uh, hit and run kind of a thing. This is these are the things that kind of stood out. I take notes as I'm listening to it, like a big production, like a really fat production, we'll call it. The guitar work, it's just there's a different tone to the sort of like the guitar fills and, and just the, the guitar parts and the solos. Lots of diversity, very melodic. And uh, man, those tempo changes. Jesus, you guys are just. I think that's a pretty good take. I mean, especially for a one listen type of a thing. They, you know, to start with the production, we. We use Colin Richardson again. He's been, he's, this is his fourth project with us. Mm -hmm. And he's, uh, you know, beyond, I mean, he's a friend. We trust the guy, you know, he's, he did a, a record for us from soup to nuts called Killbox, And that is a heavy piece of real estate. I think it was just released in 2004 when the, the popularity of the genre was not way up there. Wasn't at its healthiest state, but that's one of the best sounding fucking records we've ever done. And directly responsible to him, you know, he is yeah. directly responsible for that. So when he did this mix, you know, we didn't give him a lot of guidance. I mean, we did the production and kind of guided him along with regard to what our ideas were, but not generalization and sound. But I do remember saying to him, uh, or Didi saying to him, rather, we agreed on this. Um, you know, we want a record that you can play really loud, but it doesn't tire you out. That if you, yes. you know, sometimes you get one of those records, you put on four tracks, you got it on a nine, you go, I got to take a break. I need a nap. <laughs> it's heavy as fuck, but I need a nap. And I think he did that. And the way he did it was that he used, um, for instance, some of the natural drum resonance from the room that he mixed in with whatever was digital. Uh, he, he did a throwback guitar back to the, like, the kind of early 90s. So it's really something, it's like it's like capturing two eras. It's like capturing something in the past and exactly the present and listening to those two eras simultaneously. So that's where that big fat production comes from. That's a very, actually, you nailed it. I feel like sometimes it's like the first two records, especially when you're vocals on some parts, right? Whereas the intensity, of course, is the last few records, right? Um, tell me about... Scorch to me is sort of the song itself and maybe describe that a little bit to people. I mean, this is like, it kind of reminds me of like a meatloaf song in a sense where it doesn't sound like meatloaf. Don't get me wrong. It's sort of like it's long melodic and there's just so many things going on, but it still retains its melody at the end of the day and its intensity. Tell me about Scorch, the song. Well, the fires were burning and the dyes were howling way down in the valley. <laughs> Bad out of hell. It's a perfect thing. Hey, with a gun and it's a shit, man. I got laid to that record. I love it. <laughs> I was like, that was my introduction. That was like the time of my introduction into girls. I was actually in high school. <laughs> so... <laughs> Scorched. Um, you know, I, I tend to agree with you because. When you get into that chorus, it becomes that kind of a hooky sing song type of a back and forth thing, even though it's got its, you know, it's heavy, heavy approach to it. So it has kind of a traditional thrasher with kind of a, a rock and roll sing song approach. But the thing to me that makes the record, that sets the tone for the record is the guitar intro into the song scores. And the reason I say that is because 
the way I was describing the production prior as being two eras, but listening to it simultaneously, this is something to me that as soon as I heard it on the demo, I thought to myself, man, this is, is the way to open a record because it sets the tone for what's to follow that. Not just the song scorch, but everything beyond that. And what I mean by that is that it's from that other place. It's yeah. something that you would have heard, you know, a maiden or a priest do back in, you know, the early 80s. They would do something, lean on that guitar heavy shit. So it sets a tone for everything and perfect for walking into Scorched, which has got that kind of rock and roll sing song vibe to it that is uh, just packaged up neatly in a in a thrash package. What about the lyrics? Scorch your earth, scorch the earth, scorch your brain. <laughs> well, burn it all down, right? I mean, this was written. This was written during the pushback. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it, you know, I, I wrote this record three times. Like, you know, we were just talking uh, casually earlier before we, you know, we hit the record button. But I wrote this three times, and the first time I wrote it, it was it was you know scorch my earth and scorch my brain because I was fucking depressed as as hell, and I'm not that kind of fucking guy, you know. And it's mm -hmm. it was it was pandemic related, you know. I mean, there was no dog in the house, and my dog had passed. I'm sitting here by myself. I'm writing overkill lyrics. I'm like, oh no, <laughs> this isn't me. <laughs> so it's the, it's the beginning of the pushback, you know. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I had to recognize the fact that I wasn't representing myself correctly on the record. So I started pushing back and I wrote the record about three times and stuff like scorch the earth, scorch your brain is really just that pushback. Like, okay, we're not taking this anymore. We're coming out and we're going to set this whole fucking thing on fire. Unless, <laughs> unless you open the gates. <laughs> it's a great, actually, you know what? You couldn't have opened with a better song. And then you go into a song like Fever, and I'm going, what? Where are we going here? I go, wait a second. This is Bobby and his, uh, I would say, taking over days, maybe. Uh, you know, sort of more of the clean to, to, to screamo, like, and then back to clean again. And I thought we were going to start with a disco fever or something. I don't know. It had that sort of, uh, sort of uh, spacey vibe at the intro, right? You want to tell it's, people about that? It's, uh, you know... I think the key to, to good songwriting, or, or at least for us anyway, is to be able to marry different things together, to be able to stitch them together seamlessly, whether it be a riff or whether it be a breakdown or a mellow part into a heavy part. Um, for instance, the, the song The Surgeon, which was the first single we did, it's all it's a collection of like six riffs, but you don't realize it until you start counting them. And that's because they're they're stitched together seamlessly. And on the song Fever, this was like, I thought this was really fucking interesting. And when I turned it on, I said, oh, look at Mr. Moody and Mr. Mellow and Mr. fucking Scary over here with his, you know, his, ooh, you know, ghost-like shit. And I started whispering to those parts, you know. I was doing all this other shit that was just so not me. And I think he had the nose right in the head with the taking over days because I had a much cleaner voice back then. And it was due to the fact that I had been taking vocal lessons. I, I developed polyps on my chords and they sent me to a guy in a city named Don Lawrence, who everybody's gone to this fucking guy. D. Schneider to Life Agony and Tony Harnell. Every fucking rock guy who's lived in New York has gone. Well, in any case, I'm out in the kitchen. I, I'm thinking to myself, I'm ruining the shit out of this fucking song by trying to overthink it. And I'm making Linguini and white clam sauce out the stuff here. <laughs> and I'm singing... I'm singing over the mountain, you know, and I'm having a time of my life, you know, oh, the mountain. and I think to myself, that's it. Just open your fucking mouth and let it happen. So the mellow part of fever was, you know, you know, party to that kind of thought, to that type of thinking. I'm like, I don't need to do anything fucking special except just be myself on this. And it became to me one of the, the challenges of the record, but really one of the highlights of it. Because we did so together, that mellow section with those wide open vocals and that, geez, when the when the fucking band comes in, you know, it broke grandma's dishes in the in the uh, in, in the I, I think that I, I think I don't know how high you're singing. I think that's probably the highest part, you know, that that register that you're singing in on that. that that's that's up there, man. You're going to be able to pull that off live. That was like friggin high, man. I could do that. I mean, I got no problem with the highs. I got problems with the lows. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But I, you know, I got to say it was refreshing. I have to say, right. And, and you know, it's, it's to your point at the beginning of this conversation, 
you want to put on an album that people won't get exhausted after the fourth song, right? But with a lot of interest and, you know, uh, it's eclectic, it's diverse, it's um, it's got different dynamics and characteristics. How do you make that an overkill record? You know, it's traditional heavy metal. It's got mellow sections. It's got groove. It's got thrash. It's got rock and roll. It's got blues. It's like all over the fucking map. But you you have to sew those pieces together and then take the whole thing and try to make it, you know, put your brand on it. And uh, I think that that's what we succeeded uh, in doing. And that especially um, directly, what's directly responsible is the amount of time that we had. You know what? And and that goes to when bands originally sort of form and they write music together and they release their debut album. They have this time to sort of, uh, you know, let the song sit and uh, uh, like a fine wine, right? And become better. And you can listen to them. You change it. Little nuances. You rewrite the lyrics three times, right? I would have liked to hear the lyrics in the first round. You still have (laughs) the alternate lyrics, right? I didn't change anything. I didn't know any more words. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but then there's a song like, um, what was the second song? Won't Be Coming Back. And, and this is where, again, more diversity. When you're hitting that verse, you're going, what? What's going on? It's it's just, again, you're, you're I don't know what, it, it, maybe it's just more melody. It's just more melody. That verse, the way you sing that verse on Won't Be Coming Back, it, it kind of changes a bit from the typical sort of overkill, uh, you know, verse, we'll say. There, there, there's a lot of melody injected in this, and that is directly due to the fact of how the music was written. It called for it. It's just that simple. It, you know, doing a song like "Won't Be Coming Back" with you know a a, a three note thrash, um, you know, screamo type verse, I think would have killed that song. I mean, it's it's a uh, it's a beautiful melodic piece. So. Yeah. You know, it, it, that's really the key to songwriting. And and I, and I kind of attribute getting things like that together between Didi and myself and the other boys, obviously, putting in a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, Jason is directly responsible for how this record turned out. And so is, so is Dave Linsk by the addition of their parts and their yeah. playing. Um, but it's marrying the two, two together. You know, what yeah. is it called for? And that's really the voice of experience speaking. I mean, you yes. do 20 fucking records. People still think you suck. That's fine. But you become better at what you do. It's like a craft. You know what I'm saying? If I'm a table maker and I make 20 tables, the 20th is going to be way better than the first. In my opinion, the first is like your first girlfriend. I mean, the fucking thing, it just gets bigger and bigger in your head. You're like, oh, boy, that's when girls were great. You know, or, you know, boy, she was the best. It doesn't necessarily mean that. It just means it was your first experience with it. But us as songwriters, as we've gone along, along, have matured. And that is all over this record. And that was a dirty word in my 50s. But in my 60s, mature is actually an okay word for me. <laughs> and you know, I also noticed, and I'm trying to figure, trying to find this song. I have a list here. I, again, I heard it once, right? So I'm just trying to absorb as much as I can. There was a, a part with the, the choir. Like you had a choir going on in the background in the midsection, I remember. What song was that? It's the uh, fourth cut. It's called Twist of the Wick. Wow, and that was a great song. Yeah, guitar harmonies. This this was a, oh, yes, and the choirs on the midsection. Wow, it, it really, you know, again, you, you're adding a lot more flavors in there, you know. The, eclect- the eclectic vibe to the whole thing, you know. I mean, it's, it's you know, when it starts off, it's a thrash song, but it's a thrash song plus, you know, because, of, and, and Jason starts going into some blast beats in this thing, you know. It's almost yeah. like a death, a death metal parts of this yeah. so there's this blast beats there's a choir in the, in the center section there is the, a hell of a melodic chorus and how do you sew all this shit together so you know if, if you're thinking about a pandemic where people are like locked down for you know a two-year period say and i have two years to fuck with this i had all all that extra time to be able to sew my parts into Didi's Dee parts and then and then put them all together uh, you know mine was kind of like the finishing touches i was decorating the cake you know what I mean? They baked the cake. I decorate it. And it's, um, that's a, that's a unique song. And that center section is funny. I didn't even, I was so stuck on that song. I just didn't fucking know what to do with it. And I, and I finally kept working and working harder. And I kept skipping over the center section because I wasn't going to sing in it. Well, in any case, 
I'm sitting in a studio with the guy I work with and I'm like, all right, I think we're good. I think I got what I want with this. Play it through. He plays it through and I hear the center section for the first time. I'm like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> That's beautiful. <laughs> but then you also, not only that kind of uh, sort of material or that sort of diversity, then you go back to the traditional sort of harder they fall with the gang vocals, right? I mean, yeah. if I would have removed your voice and put uh, Z- Zetro's voice there, it could have been an Exodus song in that sense, right? That's a good point. That's a good point. That, they do that. They do a, that a lot. Those gang vocals. That's that's one of their staples for sure. Yeah, yeah. So but it's nice a, to hear that. Old, yeah. Old fresh to him. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know. Okay, so just tell me about the lyrics now. We talked about the music. What kind of topics were you covering in terms of lyrics? Okay, we got the COVID bit, right? You're you're locked in your house. <laughs> Right. <laughs> with no no dog i mean you're you're stuck you're alone you know you're, you're white clams off. <laughs> and well, white i got the fresh clams I'm stirring everything around in the pot it's um you know again uh, uh not to be redundant or, but talk about is, how about this talk about the lyrics you are most impressed with like really me- meant a lot to you from which song how's that well, look, look, for instance, at the surgeon. If that was taken from a negative perspective, um, it was depressive. If it was taken from a clear the infection perspective, it becomes positive. So I took the surgeon and went from that negativity into almost a bloodletting type of a feel, you know, and uh, a medieval, the medieval lost art of bloodletting when, when you know, the, the body is worn out. So sure, it is covid uh, responsible with regard to that, uh, the outcome of that song, but only in a positive type way. You, you follow me? It's not the, it's not the negativity of a oh, poor mate. It's the, Hey, we got to cure this shit. And we got to move on, which is always kind of a positive message or overkill having a positive message and aggression. Won't be coming back. For instance, here's, um, you know, this was a, it, this was a unique conversation I had with Didi and we hardly ever talk about what where we're going what we're doing he might say wow I got a lot of riffs on this one that's simple right and he goes he goes what do you think what direction you're going and I said I don't know I said why don't you just I said why don't you write your part like it's the last record we're ever going to do I said you write it like it's the last one I'll write mine like it's the last one and we'll see what happens and in any case I'm, I'm writing my stuff and I'm working on won't be coming back. And I just injected that thought lyrically into that song that saying, hey, you know, write it like you're dying. Write it like you're not coming back. Write it like it's the most important thing in the world and we'll succeed. And so that was kind of the the, the basis of, of that song lyric. All right. What about uh, the girl one? Uh, just was it uh, know her name? Oh, just very, very, you know, it's just it's a metaphor for liberty um, and liberty, uh, you know, the gift from the French that we have in New York Harbor. Actually, it's in New Jersey. New York claims it, but it's, it's actually ours. It's on that waterline. Water yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. It's yours. Just like Giant Stadium is yours. <laughs> <laughs> that's also in New Jersey. <laughs> strange, strange enough, you know what's funny? Because I was looking at a map once, and I too was I always under the impression the Statue of Liberty was in New York Territory, but it's not, right? It's, and I realized that when I looked at a map, I go, wait a second, something's not right here. What the hell's going on? <laughs> it's, a, it's like New Yorkers always had the funniest attitude. It's kind of, we're New York, you know, stay the fuck out of here. You know, come over and spend your money, get the fuck out of here. You know, we don't want you around, you know. We have all the best stuff. Oh, yeah, we got the Statue of Liberty. Oh, no, you don't. <laughs> what, what lyrics were I on? Was I on? So, uh, yeah. Uh, no name. No name, just, okay. Um, yeah, just, a, uh, you know, a take uh, metaphor for liberty, um, uh, protecting it, um, understanding it, um, not changing history uh, for convenience. I suppose probably a... Uh, uh, a social shot at um, the flavors of the day. You know, you don't just get to like, your opinions are not facts. <laughs> you know, you know what I'm saying? Opinions are not facts. You can't just say, I don't like this. And that's a fact. That could be a fact that you don't like it. But, but the reasons you don't like it are not necessarily historical. You can't just change fucking history. It is what it fucking is. Listen, there's been mistakes. We got to move on. But you can't just fucking change. It. So 
So that's part of that. Uh, Bag of Bones is a journey. It was just a fun kind of a journey. All the songs are mock titled at one point, and uh, that one was mock titled last one. And the, I, you know, I thought it was because he wrote, Didi wrote that riff last. And I said, oh, this is the one you wrote last. He said, no, I wrote this pretty early on. It's just that it seems like a stand alone next to all the other ones. It seems like it's on its own, uh, mm -hmm. probably because of a big fat groove in it. I said, yeah, you know something? You're actually right. It does seem like the one song that is the kind of oddball, you know, mm -hmm. of the of the entire of the entire group. So we decided that it should stay last. And all I did was have some fun with it, you know. And we did the Steven Tyler, uh, Joe Perry kind of uh, harmonies in the chorus, Dee Dee and I singing them. So, so again, just an eclectic vibe through the whole thing: church bells, cellos, choirs, harmonies, you know. On and on and on. All right. So give me in one sentence for someone who's never heard this album, give me one sentence how you would define it. And I know you gave me a lot of, we talked a lot about sort of a lot of areas. And One sentence. How would you define this album? I knew there was going to be a fucking test and I didn't study. <laughs> one sentence. One sentence. You had three years. You had three years. One sentence that sort of defines Porch. this album. Torched is where we've been and what we are. All right. Okay. All right. So you have a tour coming up. You're going back to, I think it's Germany and Spain, correct? Yeah. I mean, most of Western Europe. I mean, Italy, you'll be in there. Uh, France, Belgium, Holland, Switzerland. It's going to be, that's, it's going to be good. That's like April timeframe, correct? Right. Right before the release. So it's the 13th we go. Um, 13th is our first show. The, the release worldwide is the 14th. I think it's the same day as some other thrash band. Ma something. Meta, metal. <laughs> metal. Metalica. Metalica. Yeah. Metalica. Good old Metalica. <laughs> is that one L or two L's? Um, uh, uh, how about Canada? I, I can't even remember the last time you played in Canada. Overkill just never seems to really come back. And I know it's not something you're responsible for, right? Like, I mean, it's, you know, your, your, your people, your handlers are taking care of these things. But is, are there any plans to come to Canada? Well, sh I mean, sure. I mean, we, we always plan to come there. I mean, it's just, you know, things have to be financially feasible for us to, to do. And that's really the bottom line. I mean, it's, you know, you want me to be straight about the whole thing? I mean, drop the 30% tax. <laughs> Justin. <laughs> <laughs> it's true it's true and i'm not true. you know i'm not being a dick about it but i mean if somebody said hey you know i can't pass the t this on to the to the ticket you know buyer then it's kind of like you're kind of working for the promoter for the day you know I, mean, I don't know what people think that you know everybody's making millions of bucks we're getting x amount of money that's 30 percent is actually more than our profit we're coming up to like sell 100 yeah, t-shirts yeah, that's really what yeah. we're doing and it's not I have nothing against going to Canada. I fucking love it. I mean, I'm a fucking hockey fan. I always feel like I'm in the Mecca when I'm up there. You know what, you know what I'm yeah. saying? Whether I'm in Toronto or Montreal or, I mean, I just fucking love going up there. I love the people. I mean, it's a, I, I've always felt the, the Americans and the Canadians and the Mexicans were all fucking cousins. That's as simple yeah. as it is, you know? And it's, there's differences, but similarities. Um, it's just that fucking Trudeau tax. That's, that's yeah, Trudeau. It. Damn that Trudeau. <laughs> screwed <laughs> everything up. He screwed everything up. <laughs> Funny clothes he takes pictures in sometimes. In front of temples and stuff. <laughs> for the record, I did not vote for him. <laughs> I did not vote for him. <laughs> Due to the poor tax. This is really politics. I'm just trying to be humorous about it. But Yeah, me too. But me too. It's me probably, too. you do three shows up there, man. You're fucking... They're, they're taking a big bite out of your backside. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, going back to the early years, right? Um, of course, Johnny, you know, and, and Marsha Zazula brought you guys in from Megaforce. I don't know if the word is discovered, but I guess took you on would be a better word. You make that transition to Atlantic. Was was it worth moving to Atlantic Records? Would have it been a better decision to sort of maybe, I'm not sure what happened, you know, behind the scenes, but looking back now, was it a good idea to go Atlantic or maybe just stay a little more independent? Even though there was a, I believe you guys were working together, right? Megaforce and Atlantic at one point, but 
it's actually just a distribution deal at, at the yeah. front. And we were dealing directly with Megaforce for the first, uh, you know, Field of Fire was on Megaforce only. Then the distribution was the next records that came after that up until Horoscope. And then halfway through Horoscope, we were directly to Atlantic. Um, you know, I've had different answers for this in the past. Uh, but, you know, as I get older, I'm not saying I'm get wiser, but maybe more have more understanding. And the, the understanding to me is that it was worth it because, you know, it was a huge conglomerate. It had money up the wazoo. It put us in a position to be promoted at the highest level. Um, and I think that laid the groundwork for what followed. Now, obviously, I'm much more comfortable in a smaller underground kind of label. That's the kind of band this is. Um, they understand me. I understand them. Nuclear Blast. I mean, it's a big, it's a big label, but it has an underground mentality to it, and that's and that's why it works for Overkill. But without Atlantic, all those people wouldn't have seen us. There wouldn't have been necessarily two videos for the Horoscope record. There wouldn't have been uh, as much promotion. So I think it laid the groundwork for what followed. And what followed that, you know, very soon thereafter was grunge. That's when we left, you know, Atlantic. Because we weren't the flavor of the day anymore. Nobody was trying to find the the new Metallica, you know. On the top. Did they did they sit you at a table and say, "Look, guys, you have a choice here. Are you going to play grunge like music, or are you just going to continue?" That's that's always a myth. I've never I've never been put in a position like that by anyone in a label. You know, I mean, I it, sure I, I I have a feeling they don't always understand. Um, you know, some of the big guys really just they're they're just bean counters. You know, the bean counters give them tell them what's, you know, what is really popular. This is really popular. Look how many units they sold at that particular time. But I think that, you know, if we're coming into that 90s era where that whole new depressive kind of a, a vibe came in with, you know, uh, the Seattle sound. I mean, some of it's yeah. great. Don't get me wrong. I mean, it was, uh, but they, it gave us, we were already promoted at such a high level that even the fall off that was going to happen didn't hurt us to the point where we had to go away. A lot of bands had to go away because of that. You know, they went home and they lived in their parents' basement. You know, we were like, okay, we've been promoted at a high level. Just don't take the call. When Seattle calls, just don't take the call. You know, I guess I'm saying when they're telling us to go home, just say, fuck it, we'll just leave. You know what I'm saying? And we found other labels that invested in us and we found great tours and we still did South America and Japan, went to Europe every year. Had a little bit of a hard time reaching the West Coast of the U.S. because there's like a, such a dead space uh, yeah. from the Mississippi to California. But now that's all gone away. And and I think a lot of that is due to the fact that uh, Atlantic promoted the band for that uh, that amount of time. You know, I think it's a, it's a similar story with all bands, you know, mid-level bands, we'll call it even though they didn't get the money they wanted from the big labels, they got the exposure that carried them through for, you know, decades later. Right. And uh, that seems to be the same old story. Like they didn't pay me, but that name resonates, you know, for decades. Sure. sure. I mean, and, and, and I, I ran into a lot of guys that didn't pay me, but the, the whole thing is, it is, it is not about the quick hit. It is about the long view, the long ride, you know, I mean, if you think about the value in the music that you and I love, I mean, it's transcended at this point at least three generations. And that to me is that is valuable. That means that means I've lived my life in this. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Me being one of the oldest generations in this scene, I've lived my entire fucking adult life in this. That's the long road. I mean, but that's a that's a good view to, to be able to say that this is this is how I spent my life. So Am I looking to get paid? No, I'm looking to I'm looking to get, you know, do Canadian shows and, and not have to pay to do them. But the point is, is the satisfaction is huge, is is times 10 the amount of money we would take out any. What are sort of cool moments? OK, you you know, you open for Slayer, I, I believe, at Halloween, right back in their heyday to uh, Megadeth, Peace Cells. What are some cool moments you remember from back in those days? Well, I think I got to I got to tell you a cool moment. I think I got to move on because I got a radio oh. take. Oh. Okay, okay, okay. Sure, sure, no, sure. No, wait. I'm going to tell you a cool moment. I'm not going to fuck with you here. Um We met in uh, in 1988. We went on the road with with Slayer and Motorhead. So it was Slayer Motorhead Overkill. And 
I was a big Motorhead fan, obviously the name of the band, you know, I mean, and so was Stevie. And sometimes you don't want to meet your icons, you know what I mean? The, the people that you you admire so much because, yep. God, what if I hate this guy, you know, and I'm, and or these guys, I'm going to come home and want to break all the fucking vinyl I had. Well, I met them, they were, to, it, it exceeded my expectations. They were great dudes. They were on the record 1916. We were doing Under the Influence, uh, I think Slayer was South of Heaven. So it was a great lineup with a great punch. And years later, years later in 2007, uh, Motorhead had us had us come on and do the German shows. We did like 12 or 13 German shows with them. And the last night was in Berlin. And it was just like 88. You know what I'm saying? I mean, they never forgot my first name. And they you know, were always cordial. And I'd have beers with them at a festival or something. Well, in any case, uh, the, uh, the light man, Big E, walks in. And uh, he goes, Blitz. Lemmy wants to talk to you. And I was like, oh, all right. So I walked down and he's over some me a drink. We're sitting there. He's getting ready for the show. He goes, I want you to come up on stage for the last song and sing Overkill with me. Mm. And I was like, holy shit. I mean, this is like, this is like, a, I was dreaming this. You know what I'm saying? Like 25 years ago, this was a dream of mine. So I go back to the dressing room. I know the song cold, but I take, I, I open my arm up like this and I take a Sharpie and I write the first word of every verse. So I don't fuck it up because I'm going to be really nervous, right? Forget the first word. Everything else is going to fall. So he wants me to sing in his mic during the chorus. So we're both up on his mic on the sides. And then I would have my mic over here to duet. And sure enough, we sing the chorus. And I look down at my arm to get the next one. And he goes, I see him go. And he walks up to the microphone and goes, he's got cheat notes. He's got cheat notes. It threw me under the bus. Twelve thousand Germans. <laughs> I was red as a tomato, man. I was caught dead to rights. You know, here's a guy in Overkill doesn't remember the song Overkill. <laughs> Good, great story, man. Great story. I jumped, right, I jumped right into the audience, upside down, and I think he was still yelling, "Cheat no!" <laughs> <laughs> All right. On that note, I know you have another interview. April fourteenth, scorched. I was pretty impressed. I was really impressed. You know, right when people thought you're going this way, uh oh, you're going that way. Very well made. Very well made album. Yes. That's the that's the the best thing about this whole thing. Do whatever the fuck you want. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Bobby. A pleasure always, and uh, hope to see you on tour soon. Jimmy, always a pleasure, man. Love the chat. <laughs>